Hey, Ankeny Free family, happy October. Thank you for joining with us in worship this morning. We're so excited that you're here. If you are new or visiting us this morning for the first time, we would just love to connect and, and get to know you better. One great way to do that is to reach into the seat in front of you and grab a little connection card. You can fill that out and place that in one of our offering boxes in the back of the worship center as you leave today. Or just connect with us online at ankenyfree.church. You click that connect button and you can connect with us that way. Ankenyfree.church, also a great place to find out about our upcoming Harvest Week, any other events that are coming up soon, as well as Bible studies, and uh, really just anything you want to know about Ankeny Free Church. There are two big things happening on Sunday, October 16th, that we are very excited about, so mark your calendars. Um, the first is that we will have our theology class starting up once again. This is a weekly class that will meet Sunday mornings and they're going to begin this series of classes by walking through the Apostles' Creed together. This is going to be an amazing opportunity for anyone who wants to dive deeper into their faith, learn about kind of the roots and the foundational beliefs of the Christian faith, why we believe what we believe about God and His Word. Um, so we definitely do encourage you to head over to ankenyevents.church and read more and learn more about the theology class starting up on the 16th. This next announcement is for the guys. Join us right here at Ankeny Free Church on Sunday, October 16th, starting at 3 p.m. for smoked meats, appetizers, a cornhole tournament. Uh, it's gonna be Bills versus Chiefs football on the big screen. We did this last year, we had a blast, so we're doing it again. Uh, last year, I know we had a lot of guys bring a neighbor, brought a friend, brought a coworker, and it's just a great time to kind of bring guys in to connect with other guys and just share the love of Christ and have a blast together. So definitely encourage you to sign up for that also at ankenyevents.church. All right, well, we have a special guest with us today. We have Aslan McCarthy, straight from Togo, West Africa. And Aslan, if you wanna step on in here, and if you want to just share with us just a little bit, maybe about what God is doing through your ministry in Togo, and then maybe just a little bit about how we can be supporting you and praying for you as a church family. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to do that. God has been doing some amazing things in Togo, and it's just been a gift to be a part of it. We're seeing so many people give their lives to Jesus and become disciples of him to look more like him every day. And it has been an absolute joy to be able to partner with these new disciples. And I would just like to ask that you would join us in praying for specifically for these new disciples that are being made, that they would be um, that they would be able to grow in the Lord, that they would uh, have a desire to uh, to seek Him and all that they're doing, and really ultimately, our our desire is that these disciples would be able to make more disciples, who make even more disciples and more disciples, so that we can see uh, more people in Togo and in the neighboring country of Benin reach for Jesus. So we, I really just appreciate your guys's prayer. Thank you so much for the ways that you've come alongside me already. And uh, I'm just excited to see what else God has planned. Well, Aslan, thank you so much for being here. And Aslan and I are just about to sit down and record a little podcast together so you guys can learn even more about Aslan's life and what's happening in Togo. So we're excited to share that with you guys. Um, Aslan, how would you like to do the call to worship today? I would love to do that. Let's do it. All right. This morning's call to worship is, is something that God has really placed on my heart. And it, it really talks about the unity of the church and how we need to be united as the body of Christ. And it comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Well, good morning. Would you stand and sing with us this morning?
Good morning. My name is Todd, one of the pastors here at Ankeny Free Church, and it's great to have you here this morning. Um, we're going to uh, partake in the Lord's Supper. And so if you have not received a little, uh, a little communion kit here, if you'd raise your hands and one of the ushers would get you right here. We have a couple there. Hey, just go ahead and keep those up until someone comes up and uh, hands those to you. We take this time to remember um, what Jesus did for us on the cross, how he gave us his body and shed his blood. Uh, this is a time for those of us that trust in the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation that he is our rescue and our hope. Um, if this is not where you are at, please let the cup pass by the, the, and the bread as well. Just use this time as a time of reflection. But if this is where you're at, this is a time remembering of God's goodness and grace. So what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to pray, we're going to spend some time in prayerful meditation, and then I'm going to read the passage, and we're going to take the bread together, and then we'll take the cup together. Let us pray. Father, we ask that in this solemn moment, we remember your goodness and grace. Lord, we remember your great and undying love for us, that you sent your Son be a sacrifice, to be our means of redemption, Lord, uh, to be the way that we would spend all eternity with you. And so, Lord, we want to do this with, with seriousness and with hope. So search our hearts now, we ask, in Christ's name. Father, it was, it was Christ whose body was given for us in order that we might be united with him. His blood shed so that we can be covered, atoned for our sins, made new and clean. So Lord, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Hear now the words of Holy Scripture that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father, I pray our hearts are renewed, that we are filled with hope and anticipation. Lord, now as your redeemed people, you have sent us out into this world. So I ask, Lord, that you would bless us as we once again lift our voices in praise and we open up our hearts to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would, please stand.
song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Amen. Please be seated. morning. It's good to see you. Hope you're doing well. I was uh, uh, reading and I saw this story of a young pastor, a very young pastor that was doing his first marriage ceremony and he was extremely nervous, very nervous doing his first marriage ceremony. You know, it's understandable. So he goes to his uh, senior pastor, and he asks for advice. He goes, hey, I'm, I'm very nervous. It's my first time marrying a couple, officiating a wedding. I'm very nervous. Do you have any you know, advice for me? And his senior pastor graciously said, yes, of course. I've done this for a little while. I kind of know some of the tricks of the trade a little bit. And you know, if and when you get nervous, I, I would just say to uh, recite scripture to yourself. That will help calm you down and get you back on track. So it's the day of the wedding. The young pastor, he's, he's there. The, the groom is with him. The, the bride has made her way down the aisle. The auditorium is full of, you know, their closest family and friends. And he starts to get into the ceremony. And then at some random weird moment, he just blanks. He loses his train of thought, his palms are sweaty, his knees are weak, his arms are heavy. He might go home and eat mom's spaghetti, I don't know, but that's not relevant to the story. He is very nervous and very uh, afraid of what's going on. And then he remembers his pastor's advice. Just recite scripture to yourself. And so he stands there with the bride and groom in front of him, and he recites out loud, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. (laughs) We're in the fourth and final week of our series uh, called For Better or For Worse. It's all about marriage and relationships. And I pray that this series has been a a joy, a help to you, uh, to to your marriage, um, to your household as we seek God's word. for truths, timeless truths that stand the test of time uh, about marriage and about relationships, whether you're married now, whether you've been married in the past, whether you're not married at all or haven't been married, uh, these are good things for all of us to be encouraged in, to be reminded of, uh, and, and to walk in and to have the security to know that God has a lot to say about marriage. Well, this morning, uh, we're talking about trust in marriage. Trust in marriage, it might be the single most important thing for a couple to share, uh, trust in each other besides uh, a mutual commitment uh, to the Lord and having both people in the marriage relationship be uh, saved, be believers. Um, We're talking about trust in marriage this morning, so I'd encourage you to go ahead and turn in your copy of God's Word to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, first book of the Bible, second chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2. Well, a husband read an article to his wife as they were lounging around the house some lazy Saturday afternoon, and he read an article to his wife about how women use 30,000 words a day to a man's 15,000 words a day. And the wife replied very quickly with, that's because we have to repeat everything to men. And her husband looked at her and said, what? (laughs) So go ahead, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 if you missed that. Genesis uh, chapter 2, as we're looking at trust in marriage this morning, last week... um, 
I don't remember if it was after the first or second service, forgive me, but last week I had the privilege of meeting the nations, and and no, I didn't do this round-the-world excursion trip and visit all the nations of the world. There are a couple in our church, met the, the nations, and they shared with me that they had been married for 70 years, and I think that's amazing, and it got me thinking about you know, what's like the world record for, you know, the longest marriage. And I I found this, this isn't very current, but it's probably the best I could find. In 2005, so a little while ago, the Guinness Book of World Records said that Percy and Florence Aerosmith held two records. The first was the longest marriage of a living couple, 80 years And then having the largest married couple's aggregate age, 205 years, they shared life together. Both Mr. and Mrs. Aerosmith, you know, they've since passed away, but they left some good advice for those of us that, you know, want to have a long-lasting marriage. Florence, the wife, she said this, you must never go to sleep angry. If you've had a quarrel, you make it up. Never be afraid to say, I'm sorry. Now, that's, that's great advice. That's really good. Now, now, Percy, the husband, you know, he had slightly more humorous advice. Percy said the secret to his long marriage was held in just really two words. Yes, dear. <laughs> so we're in Genesis chapter 2 this morning, starting in verse 21. I hope by now you've turned there, have God's word in front of your eyes, phone, tablet, uh, Bible, looking on with the neighbor. Make sure, God, make sure God's words is in front of your eyes. Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Bow with me as we pray, as we open our time together this morning. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather together again. Um, Lord, after the last couple years, Lord, let us not take this time of being together, of seeing each other, of, of hearing each other, sing, of taking communion together, of sitting next to each other under the preaching of your word. Let us not take these times for granted and let us hold high the sanctity of gathering together as a church body, the importance of coming together weekly, corporately, to remember the resurrection, to build each other up in good Christian fellowship, to worship you as a local church body, and to hear from you through the preaching of your word. Father, be with us now. Help me as we talk about, Father, trust in marriage, marriage that you have ordained. Father, give me the words to say. Speak through me, Father, in a mighty way. Use me in a mighty way beyond my capabilities. And Father, help us to pay attention to these things as regardless if we're married or not, these truths are helpful for us to be reminded of, to be encouraged in, and maybe even to be challenged in. And Father, help us to walk away from this time um, being more like your son, Jesus. And Father, give us grace. Lord, we love you. We're thankful. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Wife, I have five points. Um... to to help us understand our passage this morning. The first one is is an overarching theme, an overarching point, and it speaks to the relationship of a husband and wife. And then the last four um, 
you could call the laws of marriage and four ways really to make sure you foster trust in your marriage relationships. So the first point we see is parity in verses 21 through 23. Now here we have the making of the woman, and she is to be a helpmeet for Adam. Observe that Adam was created first, Eve was created after him, and if the man is the head, the woman is to be the crown, a crown to her husband, the crown of the visible creation. The man was uh, dust redefined, God made man out of dust, and so if woman was made out of man, woman is double refined because she was made out of man. God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. Now, why did God do that? Why didn't God just go, poof, here's the woman? Well, several theologians and commentators said that, that, that God uh, cannot be seen in the act of creating. So man is not permitted to watch God uh, create things. The rib that the Lord took out of Adam is not a metaphorical rib like some people have suggested. Maybe you've heard that, but it is a literal rib for theological reasons and um, other reasons as well. The language of one of Adam's ribs pictures a long, curved, glistening, glistening rib still moist with Adam's fluids and warm with Adam's marrow. And no, men don't have one less rib than women. I remember being a little uh, kid in Sunday school growing up, and when we'd walk through this passage, I would count, try to find the space in my rib cage where I thought, you know, I'm missing one compared to women. But yeah, Adam, the rest of his life, was missing a rib, but his children uh, could count them all. His children had all, have, had all the ribs they needed. Adam and Eve were not created uh, ex nihilo, meaning out of nothing. Adam was created out of dust, and Eve was created out of Adam's rib. She was made from the same stuff as man. The same bone, the same blood, the same DNA. The woman's creation out of Adam is the basis for her equality. As the Puritan Matthew Henry puts it, not made out of his head to top him, not out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be loved. God brought Eve to Adam and Adam laid eyes on his wife, and she was a mirror of himself with some very agreeable differences. The second thing we see from our passage this morning, and it's really the first way to build trust in your marriage, we see, number two, priority. Priority. Uh, the beginning of verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. When God designed the marriage covenant, he did so with the intent that this special commitment between a man and a woman would be more important than any other human relationship. This is the reason God commanded a man to leave his father and mother for the cause of marriage. The word leave in our verse here, Genesis chapter 2, Verse 24 is the Hebrew word azab, which literally means to loosen or to relinquish. And so when God said that a man should leave his father and mother when he married, he, he meant that a man was to relinquish the highest position of commitment and devotion previously given to his parents in order to give that position to his now new wife. To put it simply, God designed marriage to operate as the most important human relationship in our lives. It is only second to, in priority to our relationship with God. And if we put marriage in any 
position of priority other than the one that God has instituted, it will not work. If you examine any problem that may exist in your marriage or in marriages of your friends or families, it won't take long to see that many of the issues that result are a, re- are a result of misplaced priorities. In fact, untold millions of couples have ended up in a divorce court because they failed to properly uphold the priority of their marriage covenant. Millions of, millions of other married couples live frustrated, strife-filled lives for the very reason of a lack of priority. I have a couple ways that we can prioritize different things in our marriages, and these are kind of just subheadings. The, the first one is prioritized communication. Prior, prioritized communication. You know, you can't microwave communication, and nothing can substitute it. If you are too busy to talk to your spouse, then you have to find another area of your life to sacrifice so your marriage doesn't. Prioritizing our spouse means our marriages have to be the first priority in our lives in real terms. There's no possible way you could be obeying the law of priority and not communicating properly with your spouse in a manner that satisfies his or her needs. I heard the story of a husband looked to his wife as he turns on the first football game of the season and he said, well, If we have to talk about anything, say it now. (laughs) Next, let's talk about prioritized relationships. You know, if you realize that maybe your children have replaced your spouse as your first priority, you need to make it right. First of all, you need to repent to your spouse and ask them for forgiveness. And second, you need to stop responding to the constant demands of your children. Of course, love them, care for them, disciple them, shepherd them, but do not allow your children to violate the boundaries of your marriage. Teach your kids to respect your marriage. Also, create new disciplines in your marriage to redirect your time and your energy to your spouse in a prioritized, regular manner. Even though many times the passions of a marriage sometimes fade at this point because of the problems that have existed, that doesn't matter. Don't let your feelings dictate your actions. Do the right thing and the passions of your marriage will return. And then lastly, under priority, let's talk about prioritized romance. Prioritized romance. Anything that isn't growing is stagnant and will eventually become entropic and die. In other words, if it isn't growing, it's headed in the wrong direction and will only get worse. Therefore, when a relationship stops growing and loses its focus and passion, it will get worse over time until it's dead. This is why Jesus wouldn't idly stand by and watch as his precious saints in Ephesus in the New Testament emotionally drift away from him. Because of his great love for us, he fights for the priority and integrity of our relationship with him. And he knows that it's possible to keep a relationship strong and growing over a lifetime. Let me ask you a few questions and just answer these to yourself. When is the last time you tried to do something cute with your spouse? When is the last time, and I'll just ask you this straight out, don't answer this out loud, please don't answer this out loud. When is the last time you just made out? When is the last time you wrote them a silly little note that made them smile? When is the last time you had a date night? When is the last time you went out of your way to show your spouse that you're thinking about them and that you love them? A married couple, I heard this story, they had a quarrel. And they ended up uh, giving each other the silent treatment. We've all been there, right? The silent treatment, the oldest trick in the book, right? Two days into their mute argument, the man realized he needed his wife's help in order to catch a flight to Chicago the next morning for a business meeting. He had to get up 
at 5 a.m. Now, want, not wanting to be the first person to, to, to speak, right? You don't want to be the first person to give in. He wrote on a piece of paper that, says, that said, please wake me up at 5 a.m., and he put it on his wife's night, nightstand. The next morning, the man woke up only to discover his wife was already out of bed, and it was 9 a.m. His flight was long gone, and he had missed it. And as he was about to find his wife and demand an answer to why she didn't make sure that he was up at 5 a.m., he first used the restroom, and when he looked up in the mirror, there was a sticky note on his forehead that said, wake up, it's 5 a.m. <laughs> Another way that we can build trust in our marriages is pursuit. Number three, pursuit. Again, verse 24, hold fast to his wife. From the very beginning, God has revealed to us the secret of staying in love and its work. Marriage only works when you work at it. The mistakes that cause a marriage to begin a downward slide is not work, but the lack of work. Taking each other for granted and trying to coast through life on the sled of past memories and events creates a negative energy that causes relationships to begin to slide backwards. Just because you live in the same house or share the same kids or share the same bank account does not mean that you will feel anything for your spouse or have a strong relationship. For the rest of your life, you must work every day at your marriage for it to be rewarding and healthy and growing. And when you stop working on your marriage, your marriage stops working for you. In many ways, marriage is is like the muscles in our bodies. When we exercise them regularly, our bodies become strong and, and healthy and fit. However, when we lie around and and don't exercise, our bodies become weak. And the more we lie around, the less we feel like exercising and the weaker our muscles become. Marriage only works when you work at it. It requires energy and effort. The degree to which you are willing to work at your marriage relationships is, marriage relationship is the exact degree to which it will work for you. Here is the big question regarding this issue. What are we working to accomplish? What are we moving towards? What's the point of all of our efforts in our marriage relationship? And to answer those questions, it's, it's a very simple answer. Here it is. We are working to meet our spouse's needs. We are working to meet our spouse's needs. And their basic needs might be different from yours. They might be similar. They might be the same. You might not share the same basic needs as your spouse. We typically have a hard time sometimes trying to even understand their needs when they express them to us or even ask us for assistance. Therefore, for needs to be met and mutual satisfaction to be achieved in our marriage relationships, one element must be present in both spouses, and that is a servant's spirit. A servant's spirit. The greatest marriage on earth is two servants in love with each other. The worst marriage on earth is two selfish people in love. And to understand this issue, we must realize that when we get married, we are at each other's mercy as it relates to getting our needs met first. My community group uh, earlier this year, we went through um, like an eight or nine week study on marriage and one of the biggest things I took out of that time in my community group was is that marriage should almost be a competition for who could be last. Marriage should be a competition. You and your spouse should almost try to see, man, who could put each other first more? How can I take a back seat in everything in my marriage to put my wife first, to serve her, what she needs, how she interprets things, what she wants to be done. And she should be doing the same thing for me. 
The greatest marriage on earth is two servants in love, two selfless people in love. The fourth thing we see in our passage this morning and the third way we can build trust in our marriage relationships is is partnership. Verse 24 again, the two shall become one flesh. Now, beyond the obvious meaning of becoming one flesh through sexual intercourse, Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 states a law of marriage that permeates every area of life. Once we understand and obey this law, we will experience a a significant depth of unity and bonding in our marriages. However, if we break this law, even innocently, on accident, the damage to the trust and intimacy of the relationship can be severe. To understand the full meaning and implications of the law of partnership has in marriage, consider this truth, marriage is a complete union in which all things previously owned and managed individually, separately, are now owned and managed jointly. There is no exceptions. Anything in marriage that will not willfully be submitted to the ownership of the other person is held outside of the marriage union and that produces legitimate jealousy. The act of becoming one flesh involves just more than sex. It involves merging everything owned by and associated with two persons into one mass jointly owned and managed entity. If there is anything a spouse is unwilling to merge into the marriage, that spouse is breaking the law of partnership and violating the rights of the other spouse. The law of partnership is absolute in marriage. We must share everything as equals. The number one enemy of the law of partnership is dominance because dominance destroys intimacy because it breaks down walls and doesn't want to share. It wants to control. As human beings, we were created by God to relate to our spouse as equals. Control goes against God's design. God created marriage in the Garden of Eden and the word Eden means pleasure and delight. And this is important for us to remember because so many people today equate marriage with pain and suffering, not pleasure, not delight. But the fact remains that God originally designed the marriage relationship as a relationship of ultimate pleasure and ultimate delight. Adam and Eve were created beautifully naked without shame in a wonderland of intimacy together. They were equals. They were complementary equals. And as such, they shared their lives in peaceful intimacy just as God designed it. The fifth thing, last thing we see from our passage this morning and and the last way that we can build trust in our marriages is this. Number five, that's purity. Verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. You know, in marriage, we start out instinctively desiring to share ourselves with each other. However, for this to take place, there must be a prepared and protected environment, an atmosphere where we can regularly get naked. God designed the nakedness of marriage to include every area of our lives, body, soul, and spirit. When we are able to undress ourselves in every area before our spouses without shame and fear, we are in a healthy place for a strong, intimate relationship to develop. If we cannot expose ourselves completely before our spouses, it means we are hiding something. This hidden thing needs to be exposed. The reason is simple. God created us with a need for intimacy and it can only recur in an atmosphere of honesty and vulnerability with our spouses. Perhaps you've never realized that you had a need for honest and open nakedness in front of your spouse, but you do. 
And this isn't simply just physical exposure. It's way more than that. But it's the exposure of everything about you. Who you are, how you think, what you want, your desires, the way you see things, your emotions, things from your past. You need to open up and reveal yourself. But you cannot do that in just any place or with any person. Healthy nakedness must happen in a special place with the right person. Although special friends and family can accommodate the need for exposure to some degree. Marriage is the singular place that God created for us to fulfill the need for total exposure to reveal our true selves. Now at this point you may say, well I'm married but man there's just no way that I can truly let my spouse all into my world or wholly expose who I am or what I've been through or what I'm hiding to my spouse. You may not be able to do that at this time, but to fulfill your inner desire, to become completely open and vulnerable in marriage, the truth still remains that God created a need in all of us for complete exposure with our spouses. The fact that your situation does not make this feasible does not eliminate the need or change that, that God created marriage as the first place for that to be met. If you're struggling in your marriage, we've gone through four weeks of this series. Maybe you've been here all four weeks, maybe you're just here today or somewhere in the middle. If you're here and you're thinking, man, my marriage needs some work, number one, join the club. But if you're also sitting here and maybe you even have a heightened sense of, man, we've been struggling, we've been walking through issues, and it doesn't feel like we're making any traction whatsoever, and it might be helpful to bring an outside voice in or seek some just biblical wisdom. We would love for you to reach out to Pastor Todd, to myself, sometime this week, and we would love to help you walk through whatever you're walking through, to be a help to you, to, to come alongside you in your struggle, to, to pray with you and your spouse, uh, to maybe just give some biblical insight as someone not in the relationship, As the band comes and we close out this series, I couldn't think of a better way to finish the sermon series, to finish this sermon today, than looking at Ephesians chapter 5 together. You can turn there in your Bibles if you would like. You don't have to. But Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 22 to 33. And I'm simply going to read this passage to us as an encouragement, as a challenge, as a help. And then we're going to pray, and then we're going to go on with the rest of our Sunday. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes this masterfully done um, paragraph about the husband and wife relationship. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. 
In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Father, we love you. And Lord, we need help. Lord, none of us in this room have perfect marriages because for those of us that are married, Lord, we're we're all sinners and we're married to a sinner. Father, give us grace. Strengthen the marriages in our church. Father, help us to serve our spouses as a servant. Help us to love and respect and cherish and esteem each other. Help us to build each other up. And for those in this room that aren't married, whether they've been married in the past or they've never been married, whatever situation people are living in today, Lord, we just ask that this information from your word be timeless truths that stick with us, that help us understand the way we ought to walk as Christians, the way we ought to hold high the marriage relationship, the way we ought to encourage others that are married, the way we ought to think about marriage. Father, if there's, though, if there's those here in this room that are walking in a season of struggle and a, a season of hardship, Father, we don't want them to walk alone. Number one, we know you're with them in the struggle. But two, Father, let them reach out to a trusted friend, someone here at church, someone on staff, that they can seek good godly counsel from someone who loves the Lord and loves them. Father, help us to have marriages that are built on your love and built on trust. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for this time. I thank you for my friends. Jesus, I pray. All God's people said, amen. Would you stand, please, and let's make this our prayer that Christ would be magnified in us, in our lives, in our marriages, in all things. Were creation suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Where the whole earth and his eminence, his name burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops, we hear cry.
song and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be for my feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Death is just a doorway to resurrection life. my prayer that you love me about more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God go in peace